think we are ready to, to restart. And uh, Mr. Forster, or whomever you designate. Uh, thank uh, you, Mr. President. Mr. Mr. Stern will present this witness. Be thank be you. Be let me le doy la bienvenida al señor Franco y le voy We welcome you Mr. Franco and I'm going to ask you to read out the witness statement. Thank you, honorable members of the tribunal. I solemnly swear upon my honor and conscience that I will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Franco. Uh, do you have a cop uh, in front of you a, a copy of the statement you have submitted in this, in this arbitration dated March 10, 2011? Sí, la tengo. Yes, I do. Do you ratify that statement and affirm its truthfulness before the tribunal? Sí, por supuesto. Yes, of course, I ratify it. Uh, 2007, have you been the lead lawyer representing Ferrovias Guatemala? in the Lecividad litigation before the Contencioso Administrativo Court? Sí, es correct. Yes, that's correct. Do you hold any teaching positions? Sí, es correcto. Yes, that is correct. I am a university professor, principal professor at a university in Guatemala City, the Universidad Mariano Galvez. I have been and I am at this time a full professor for the courses in Administrative Law 1 and 2, uh, Administrative Procedural Law, Constitutional Law of Guatemala, Constitutional Procedural Law of Guatemala, and uh, Civil and Commercial Procedural Law, and uh, General Theory of Procedure. General Theory of Procedure. theory of procedure. Uh, the interpreter apologizes. The interpreter apologizes. Is he listen, hearing the internet transmit? Uh, the interpreter apologizes. The interpreter apologizes. Is he listen, hearing the internet transmit? The interpreter apologizes. <laughs> we attempt the apology. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Franco, do any of uh, the courses that you just uh, mentioned that you teach, uh, do they involve teaching the law and procedure of La Cividad in Guatemala? Yes, of course. The administrative law classes, and specifically the point is developed in the law, uh, rather in the course on administrative procedure. quickly. Um, Mr. Franco, when did the state of Guatemala commence the uh, Contesioso Administrativo action to confirm the declaration of the Cividad against contracts 143 and 158? The action was presented by the Guatemalan state through the Office of the Attorney General on the 24th of November, 2006. When was Ferrovias first served with the complaint in that action? The uh, notification of the first resolution and the content of the complaint was uh, notified about six months after it was filed. The notice was given of it in May 2007. Today, uh, more than five years since the uh, La Cividad action was commenced, uh, has the Contencioso Administrativo Court rendered its judgment in the case? No, to date, after more than five years since the complaint was filed, we still do not have a judgment from the contentious administrative uh, court. Ferrovi has filed in the administrative court proceedings since its commencement in 2006. Four uh, challenges have been presented. 
gave the, uh, those motions, those four motions, cause any de uh, cause delays of any significance in the proceedings? No, ninguno. De ellos no, none of them did. They were processed and resolved without provoking any undue delay in the procedure. Franco, you, uh, you can now answer questions from uh, Guatemala's council. Is Mr. Horta who will ask the questions? We can. Mr. Horta, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Franco. How are you today? What are the yes? Being good morning. Uh, fine. Thank you. Good morning to you all. Um, just setting the, uh, the the context of your appearance here today, you, um, I think, as you mentioned in response to some of the questions from Mr. Stern, you've been acting as um, a lawyer on behalf of uh, Ferrovias uh, since the year 2007. Is that correct? Sí, es correct. Yes, that is correct. Do any other legal work for Ferrovias before uh, you agreed to serve as their lawyer in the current contencioso administrativo action that's pending in Guatemala? Eh, el proceso. Yes, a constitutional motion. Eso fue. That was in September of 2007. Was that a constitutional action that you filed in relation to the contencio contencioso administrativo action that is pending and in which you are the lawyer? Did it relate to that action? Uh, sí, es correcto. Yes, that's right. Against the uh, order of la cividad issued by the President of the Republic. Could you explain briefly uh, to us what the arguments were that you made in that constitutional uh, uh, filing, what you were seeking? Sí. Yes, of course. Under Guatemalan legislation, All acts by administrative agencies should be based on full compliance with the law, the Constitution, and the statutes. In this case, what we have put forth and what is at issue in that constitutional action is that the President of the Republic did not have sufficient authority to have declared la cividad for various reasons. What are these? First, what the law establishes is that the president can declare the lesividad of acts and resolutions. It clearly so establishes. If you carefully read the article, it says acts and resolutions. At no time does it mention contracts. What's the difference? Well, an act or a resolution is a unilateral declaration of will by an organ or an agency, whereas an agency is an agreement that involves the meeting of the minds of two parties. That was one of the points. Another of the main points is that the President of the Republic, based on judgments handed down by the court, has the power to declare lesivos, acts which emanate from the executive exclusively. He cannot declare lessivo acts that do not emanate from the executive. In this case, FEGWA is an autonomous entity with a distinct juridical personality from that of the state. And third, there was a discussion about the contracts that were declared lessivo. Well, it was said that they established two alternative means for dispute resolution, uh, conciliation and arbitration. So those were the main arguments in that declaration, or rather in that uh, constitutional action. Thank you, sir. Um, did the Supreme Court hear, or did, I'm sorry, did the Constitutional Court <coughs> hear those claims? Si. Yes, it did. We'll get to it in a second, but just if you could just tell us, did the Constitutional Court accept or deny your arguments? Oh, 
Correcto. Eh, aquí hay que explicar algo bien. Here we have to explain something that's quite important. In order to bring a constitutional action, there's a principle called the principle of definitiveness, which the constitutional law regulates, which establishes that prior to having to bringing an amparo action, one must exhaust regular remedies. Nonetheless, in the instant case, there was no regular administrative remedy to exhaust. Why? Because clearly Article 9 of the law on the contentious jurisdi uh, juris uh, administrative jurisdiction regulates that no remedy may be brought against a resolution by the president or vice president. So in this case, on establishing that clear violation, we went to the constitutional jurisdiction. It, we must be very clear that the constitutional court did not rule on the merits. That is to say, it did not uh, say that it was inadmissible, but rather the uh, administrative court, what it established is, was that the points that we argued as clear violations of the rights of ferrovias had to be uh, brought to the contentious administrative jurisdiction. That's how it was. Correctly, the Constitutional Court declined to, well, let's go step by step. The Constitutional Court denied the petition, but in doing so, allowed Ferrovías to raise those very same arguments before the Contencioso Administrativo Court, the Administrative Court. Is that correct? Sí, es correct. Yes, that is correct. Returning to the, the, the first uh, area of questions, other, other, th other than the action that you're currently handling for uh, Ferrovias in the administrative court and the action that you filed before the constitutional court, have you done any other work for Ferrovias? Uh, sí, correct. Yes, correct. I have been the lead attorney in some other proceedings underway in Guatemala. For example, let's see, at some point in time, an action was brought, a, a, a tax claim against Ferrovias. Also, an executive proceeding for the collection of an alleged debt for the sending of materials and merchandise. In addition, defending a defense in a criminal proceeding, which without any basis was brought against the legal representative of Ferrovias, which was already resolved, and this uh, person was acquitted. It was uh, totally out of place. Uh, sí. Yes, at this moment, those are the ones I recall. You are a member of the Diaz Duran and Asociados Central Law Law Firm, correct? Sí, es correct. Yes, that is correct. And your partner is Mr. Carrasco sitting over there across or next to Mr. Posner. Is that true? Uh, socio mío, no. Partner of mine, not directly. I am an attorney who is an associate with uh, the firm, but I'm not a partner of the firm. I work for the firm. Associate at the Diaz Duran and Asociados firm. <coughs> And Mr. Carrasco sitting over there next to Mr. Posner is one of your bosses. Yes, yes that is correct. In relation to uh, your declaration, the in your declaration you you claim that um, Ferrovias has not been afforded due process in the. Uh, administrative court proceeding that is currently underway, is that correct? Sí, es correct. Yes, that is correct. And you understand that Ferrovias, uh, in this case, uh, in part through 
your partner and Greenberg Traurig are arguing that they've not been afforded due process in uh, the administrative court proceeding? Correct. Yes, that is correct. Through your declaration, you are supporting their arguments in this case, is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct, that uh, due process was not afforded. Just so that we understand the parameters of your uh, declaration, uh, it is correct, is it not, that Ferrovias has been notified of the administrative court proceeding? Si es correcto. Yes, that is correct. It was notified approximately six months after the complaint was initiated. In that interim six-month period, there were no decisions made adverse to Ferrovias, were there? Prior to notice, well, since there was no legal resolution, it had not been handed down, even though the court was under an obligation to do so but it never did hand down such a decision. RL73, please. I'm going to be uh, putting up a document on the screen. For purposes of the examination, we're also going to be putting the, doc the Spanish version of the document before you so that you may read it. For purposes of the tribunal, we're putting the English version up on the screen so that they may follow along in, in English as well. <coughs> Perdón, este está en inglés también. Era en español, por favor. Now, before you entered your appearance on behalf in the administrative court proceeding, the administrative court did issue an order dated. February 23, 2007, correct? Yes, that is correct, and that was in the record, even though we did not have knowledge of it. The administrative court, in part, denied a request for injunctive measures and for provisional suspension of contract 143 and 158 that had been filed by the Attorney General's Office of Guatemala, correct? Si, es correcto. Yes, that is correct. Nonetheless, it's important to clarify that this resolution, well, no one, no one knew about it. Ferrovias didn't know about it, we didn't know about it as their attorneys, nor did the persons in general. The only thing that one knew was that in August of 2006, a declaration of la civilidad had been published. So that's what was known. This resolution, of course, not until notice of it was given in May of 2007. Um, th this ruling does not prejudice Ferrovias in the case, does it? Si es perjudicial. Yes, it does prejudice Ferrovias because, as I repeat, before the people, before the public and all, it's a declaration of lesividad that was declared, it was published in the official gazette, and so people don't understand that this has to follow a legal process with certain stages. So it uh, did prejudice the company. In addition, in other proceedings that we're involved in, when we complete a hearing or petitions, file petitions, including in several of the proceedings that I was involved in, I would bring copies of the newspaper where it was indicated that the contract had been declared less civil. It's an indication in the newspaper that it actually reflect what was actually happening in the court, such as this resolution. So, yes, it did have a negative impact on Ferrovias. Asking you about anything other than this ruling, this ruling by the um, uh, court, the administrative court uh, of February 2007. My question was, did this ruling prejudice uh, Ferrovias? Yes, it did prejudice Ferrovias from the moment 
that the lascividad was declared. As I repeat, it prejudices in that the declaration of lascividad had come several months earlier, and this wasn't known until May. So, in itself, the detrimental impact, let me explain. It's the declaration of lascividad that is detrimental itself. My apologies. Would you mind, uh, just, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it would be helpful if for the tribunal you could put uh, on the screen the actual text rather than the bottom of it, <coughs> since we can't read it. Uh, yes, my apologies. If, if you could just scroll so that the, the tribunal, and this is also um, in RL073. problem is that's a very large exhibit. Um, <coughs> Uh, oh no, this one's not. I'm sorry. So, so RL73 in your in your core bundle as well. Apologies, sir. My question, again, is not about the declaration of mm -hmm. Lasibidad. Okay, can can we agree on that? I'm not asking you about that right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yes. This ruling, not the declaration of Lasibidad. This ruling by the administrative court doesn't prejudice Ferrovias in any way, does it? No es perjudicial. It does not prejudice it as a matter of law, but as a matter of fact, it does. As, as I understand this ruling, the judge denied a request for provisional measures that was filed by the Attorney General, and in particular, denied a request that the Attorney General made to provisionally suspend contract 143 and 158. Can you explain how that, as a matter of fact, is prejudicial to your client? Correcto. Yes. As I had already said, with the declaration of lesividad, because let's recall that this resolution Specifically, the other persons, the other attorneys in the other proceedings, didn't know about this. In several proceedings in which I was involved, in defense of Ferrovias, when we would put a petition to the court, for example, to establish a bond, to give you an example of something which happened in one case, what the other party would do in that specific case would be to oppose arguing the, our, mo our motion by saying that the contract had been declared lesivo. So I reiterate that in law, no, but in fact, yes, uh, this resolution, because in other proceedings, the rights of Ferrovias were limited without any awareness that there had been a provisional suspension of the contract. So that's why. But as a professor of administrative law, you understand that the de Lacivo Declaration doesn't have any, by the President, doesn't have any immediate effect on the legal rights of uh, Ferrovias under contract 143 or 158, correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. The thing is that so long as the Declaration of Lesividad is uh, from an act or resolution that emanates from the executive, but that is not the situation in this case because it's a contract. Before the Supreme Court, but I'm, or the Constitutional Court, I wasn't asking you about those. I'm just saying you understand, as a professor that deals with issues of lascivo de, uh, of the lascivo law, that that declaration by the president did not affect in any way the legal rights that your client has in contract 143 and 158, whatever they may be. Correct? Yes, it is a step prior to the declaration of lesividad. Unless and until the administrative court issues a ruling confirming that the lesivo declaration is proper, your client will continue to have every right, legal right, that they may uh, have ever had in contract 143 and 158, correct? 
Yes, correct. Nonetheless, that's one of the violations that's been argued, that the complaint was filed and all of the stages of the proceeding went through and the ruling is not handed down. So that's one of the violations that we have also discussed. There's no legal certainty for the rights of Ferrovias in terms of when is this going to be resolved. There's no impediment, legal or material, for the uh, court to hand down a judgment. Nonetheless, to date, has not done so. We'll get to that issue in a second. Um, but, but simply going back to the point about the fact that you say that this ruling may have had some factual prejudice to your client, you as their lawyer in any other proceeding that you appear in are quite capable of communicating to any court or any other official that the Lascivo Declaration did not have any effect, legal effect, on your client's rights under their contract, correct? Uh, no, in the procedural stage, no, because what went along with it was the publication, and it's the uh, court that decides whether it grants a given measure based on that. Further, I'd like to clarify a point that's quite important, because it's like a doubt. The thing is, I could not communicate this resolution in any other proceeding when uh, Ferrovias was never given notice of it. The mere fact of presenting the uh, of the filing of the complaint, and as you can see, the complaint was filed in November. The resolution has the date February, but notice of it was given in May. So we're saying that more than six months elapsed with total legal uncertainty as to whether the complaint had been admitted, whether it had not been admitted, whether measures had been issued, what, decreed, whether uh, or injunctive relief, whether it was. Uh, issued or not. So we did not know anything about it, and I could not have done it. I could not have uh, monitored something that I did not know about. Let's try again, because I think you're misunderstanding my question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it again, OK? As Ferrovia's lawyer, and knowing, as you've already admitted uh, to us here, that the, Lecibe, the President's Lecibo Declaration had no legal effect on Ferrovia's rights under Contract 143 and 158, you are quite capable of making that argument to any other court or any other official in any other proceeding in which Ferrovias is involved, correct? No, it is not correct. I just explained that I had no knowledge of the resolution, and since uh, no notice was served, the resolution for several months did not exist, and as uh, evidence of that is the date on the resolution. I had no knowledge of the of the resolution until it was informed in May 2007. Whether you knew or when you knew about the resolution, I'm simply making the point that whether or not you knew about the resolution, you knew that the Lascivo declaration by the president did not affect your client's legal rights under contract 143 and 158. Is, is that a true statement? Correct. Correct. From the legal standpoint, yes. And from the factual standpoint, no, because of what I just said. Capable, obviously, of communicating that legal conclusion in any proceeding in which your client was involved, correct? Since I did not know whether the contract had been suspended, I, did, I was not able to communicate this because this is a decision by the tribunal, this is by the court. It, is, it goes beyond knowing the declaration of the president and whether that was going to suspend the contract or not. The court had to decide on that. I will slow down. I'm sorry. Did anyone ever notify you as counsel for Ferrovias or Ferrovias, to your knowledge, that their rights under contract 143 and 158 were suspended at any time? No. No. I'd like to take you to document number C11, please.
Sir, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to ask, before we go to that document, I'm going to ask you one, hopefully one additional question or a couple of minor questions on that same line of questioning before. You, you mentioned that notwithstanding that the um, Attorney General's petition was filed in November of 2006, that Federal Villas wasn't notified until, you said, May of 2007, correct? That's correct. That is correct. In the steps taken by the court leading up to the notification, including the well, the various steps you're, you're familiar with the, with the file. Um, are you are you claiming here that um, as a matter of Guatemalan law, that notification came to you too late? Sí, es correct. Yes, that is correct. What basis? Sobre el fundamento que toda... With the basis that any resolution based on Guatemalan law, any resolution should be communicated to the parties, otherwise the rights cannot be affected. But the law by the judicial body establishes the terms when the resolution has to be notified, and in the case instant after the resolution was passed, it should have been notified within one day upon uh, approval of the resolution. That is to say, the following day. Any orders that affect a party's rights, correct? Yes, correct. That is correct, and that is established in the law. Do any orders before you were notified in May of 2007 that affected Ferrovia's rights? Orden de quien del tribunal? An order by who? The court or who? Ninguna. None. Um, let me point you to C11, please. And for the record, C11 is the petition that was filed by the Attorney General's Office of Guatemala on 24th of November 2006. It's quite a long document, but my questions are going to go to uh, just certain, certain aspects of it. First, sir, can you confirm that my representation is correct, that this is the petition that was filed on the 24th of November 2006 by the Attorney General's Office uh, before the Administrative Court in relation to the Lacivo Declaration that had been declared by the President? Yes, this is the one. Am I correct that the government of Guatemala, the Attorney General of Guatemala, had 90 days from the time that the Lacivo Declaration was published in the official gazette, 90 days period of time within which the Attorney General could initiate this action before the administrative court? Just to clarify, under Guatemalan law, it is not the same to speak about 90, to say 90 days or three months, because when we say 90 days or days, we are referring to work days when the court is carrying out business. That is to say Monday through Friday, but when we are saying three months, these are calendar dates. So it is not the same for the contencioso administrativo, which is not the same. It is not 90 days, but three months. That the publication of the Lacivo Declaration occurred on the 25th of August, 2006? Sí, es correct. That is correct. This action was filed on the day before 
the time period would have run for the Attorney General to be able to initiate this action, correct? That is correct. In other words, the Attorney General waited almost a full three months before filing this action, correct? Correct. Correct. Now, in this action, there are two defendants, correct? Correct. Correct. To Ferrovias, the other party to contract 143 and 158, Fegua, is also named as a defendant in this action. Is that right? That is correct. That is correct. And both have been joined in the action by the Attorney General of the Republic of Guatemala, correct? No entiendo la pregunta. I do not understand what do you mean joined. Both defendants were sued by the Attorney General of the Republic of Guatemala in this action, correct? Demandada, sí. Yes, they were sued. Yes. So let's see. In the in the Spanish version, it's going to be RDC one seven two. Oh, are they? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, they're not. No. no. Bear with me. Okay, and in the English version, it is RDC 223 for purposes of, of the tribunal. And if we could just, uh, I apologize, Kelby, but if you could please scroll up to where it says peticiones or the English version petitions. Just so that the tribunal can see in context where we are in the document. Sir, these are a number of petitions or requests made by the Attorney General of Guatemala when they filed this action, correct? That is correct. Request number seven asks, or the, in, in request number seven, I should say, the Attorney General asks that FEGWA be notified of this proceeding, correct? Sí, correcto. Yes, correct. Now, in the, 
in relation to, if you could turn, I'm sorry, to, uh, in your in your version, RDC 175. RDC 175, and then in the English version, it would be RDC 225. In, in this part of the uh, petition, the Attorney General's office is seeking various forms of relief from the court, correct? Perdón, no entiendo. I don't understand. In this part of the petition, the Attorney General is seeking relief from the administrative court. It's basically telling it what it wants it to do through this petition, correct? Sí, correct. Yes, correct. And in relation to the contract 143, well, uh, strike that. In terms of the, the, the very first the very first uh, request for relief, it's asking for the court to determine that the Lacebo declaration was correct, was proper. Eh, ¿Qué numeral, perdón? What number? Number one. Sí, correcto. That is correct. Down to number two, please. In number two, the Attorney General's office is asking the court to declare, having found, assuming number one is granted, having found that the Lacebo declaration is correct, the Attorney General's office is asking the court to declare contract 143 and 158 null and void as a matter of law, correct? Correct. Correct. And in relation to request number three, the Attorney General's office is asking the court to also order, assuming requests one and two are granted, that things as between Ferrovias and Fegua should return to their original state as if the contract had never been entered into, correct? Sí, es correcto. Yes, that is correct. Specifically, they are asking FEGUA, they're asking the court to order FEGUA to return all monies that it received from Ferrovias in relation to this contract. Mm -hmm. Correct. To correct. I wasn't finished with the question. Uh, let me let me try that again. In request number three, uh, the the attorney general's office is asking the court to order Fegua to return all monies that it received from Ferrovias to Ferrovias. Correct. Sí, yes. Yes, that is correct. But. You can see that it is important also to understand that they are requesting to return the money, but they are asking for no compensation or damages for the damages cost. But before, before we finish this point, um, in addition, the Attorney General's office is asking Ferrovias to return the equipment in relation to contract 143 and 158 to FEGUA, correct? Correct. Correct. In relation to the point that you just made, Ferrovias, when it participates in this proceeding, is entitled to ask for a, an award of damages, correct? As part of this process, is that the question or is it outside the process? In this proceeding? Uh, no, en lo absoluto. Eh, no, 
absolutely not from the technical and legal point of view that is impossible because under Guatemalan law, a claim for damages should be filed before a civil court as part of an ordinary proceeding, but this is a contentious administrative court. So from the legal point of view, that is not correct. That is not right. That the Lacebo Declaration is or was proper and orders the relief in number three and yet Ferrovia still believes that it has damages on, in addition to what was ordered by this court, Ferrovia is able to later file an action in the civil proceedings to seek damages, correct? Or before the civil court, I should say, to seek damages. Si, correct. Yes. As long as a decision, uh, as long as there was an award, a final award, and but those are the violations that we have been. The process has been going on for a long time without any feasibility to solve it. But but this process has not been solved yet. This proceeding is still unsolved. Um. Was it number seven under petitions? For the tribunal, uh, let me see, for you, sir, it's, it's RDC 172. Mm -hmm. And for the tribunal, it's 223. Um, I neglected to ask you something about petition number seven. In the same, in the very same paragraph where the Attorney General asks that FEGWA be notified about these proceedings, they also ask that Ferrovias be notified about these proceedings, correct? Correct. Correct. And in relation to the timing of the notice that you received, you have no evidence, do you, that Ferrovias, I'm sorry, that the Attorney General's office asked that uh, notice to Ferrovias be delayed, do you? No. No, of course not. Now, um, in relation to the In relation to the uh, Supreme Court action that you filed, you recall that um, you and, and a number of the people on the other side of the table called a press conference? You remember that? Si, sí, correct. Yes, correct. You asked the press to attend the filing of this event, correct? Journal. Not me. Did do you know who invited the press to come? No, no. no I don't know. I'm going to object play? to this to this line of questioning. It's beyond the scope of his statement, and certainly beyond the scope of his involvement in the uh, in the constitutional uh, case. This is just for the record before you rule. This is a video of a press conference that the other side called to notify the world that they were presenting this petition before the Supreme Court. It's quite relevant to the issues that we've been discussing in this case. And, it's, and, and it has nothing to do with uh, Mr. Uh, Franco's testimony. And I'm not even sure I've seen this exhibit, to be honest with you. Uh, um, which, which one is it? Yeah. As a matter of administration of the proceedings, if you don't turn off your, uh, your light here, one doesn't take it. Any other anybody else light, so there is no way for me other than making big signs to to interrupt. 
so I think uh, he, he was, was he present, I mean, at the, at the press conference, the, the witness? I mean, is that, that would be relevant, but if not, I mean, then uh, it's not neither here or there in terms of his testimony. It, 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 well, he just answered that he was, um, that he understood that there was a press conference. Um, he can tell us whether he was present or not. I believe he was, but since I've just met him, I can't vouch for the fact that he's on the video. I can tell you that um, in relation to Mr. Stern's question, this is their exhibit, C-132. This yes, but exhibit. we are not discussing the video of the press conference. We are discussing the testimony of the witness here. Yes. So if you could limit the questions to his testimony. Right, and, and just so that we're clear, the, 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 the question was whether he had called a press conference at the time that they filed the challenge before the Supreme Court, and the witness said yes, and so I'd like to play at least a clip of the press conference. Heck no. No. Heck no. Well, I mean, we can check the, the record whether the witness said yes, but I, that's not what I understood. Oh, well, let, let, let me ask him again then, if it's okay. Are you aware that there was a press conference at which you attended in relation to the filing of the action that you filed before the Supreme Court challenging the administrative court proceeding? I knew that there was some press conference, but I did not attend that press conference. That's what I responded, that I knew of a press conference, but I did not attend the press conference, and I did not call the press conference. I did not call that press conference, and I did not attend that press conference. In the press conference, um, you're saying that in the, in the action that was filed before the Supreme Court, where the amparo was presented, you were not there when that filing was made? In, la conf in, la in the presentation, in the filing of the amparo, I was there, but I was not at the press conference. No, it's my understanding, now perhaps I'm incorrect, but that the video that we're about to play is the moment in which they presented the amparo to the Supreme Court. That's at least what the reporter says on the video. So if I could beg the tribunal's indulgence to ask <clears throat> to play this momentarily. Just, just play the video. Uh, thank you. Solo para antes Just to clarify before watching the video, once again, based on the translation and the pre press conference, I did not call any press conference, but I did participate in the filing of the Amparo. That's what I would like to clarify. But I did not call the press conference. I did not call the press conference as such. So you show it. Uh, the video is about the press conference or the presentation? It's my understanding that it is a public presentation of the Amparo, the very document that he said he is the lead lawyer in, where apparently they called a press con When I say a press conference, I mean the press was there and they're videoed presenting this document to the court. That's my understanding of what the video is. Well, again, this is a news report. It's not a press conference. I think he's, what he's conceding here. So it's, it's, again, it's nothing to do with his testimony that's been presented here. What he's trying to do is show you a news report about an event that happened at the time in which there were reporters present, but there was not a press conference involving the filing. 
of the Amparo action. Okay. Well, I, you know, I'm not asking for Mr. Stern's testimony about the document. We can play the document and just show it to the tribunal, and you can have your own conclusions about it. Well, what I object to is, is his efforts to mischaracterize the evidence in order to be able to present the evidence. So let's, let, let's see the event. En otro plano noticioso, la disputa entre ferrovías que tiene la concesión de ferrocarril y el gobierno se ahondó tras un recurso interpuesto por la empresa ante la Corte de Constitucionalidad. Este día la empresa Ferrovías de Guatemala presentó un memorial ante la Corte de Constitucionalidad. Este se presentó bajo un amparo que busca que quede sin lugar la lesividad declarada por el Ejecutivo en contra del contrato de usufructo de equipo ferroviario. Y por el incumplimiento del Estado en el pago del fideicomiso, que, cuyo objeto es darle mantenimiento a la línea del tren. El amparo señala que siendo feo a un ente autónomo e intervenido, es el interventor que en todo caso tiene que declararle sí o el contrato y no el presidente en Consejo de Ministros. Además que se violó la seguridad y certeza jurídica, esto porque no se agotó un periodo de conciliación establecido en el contrato de usufructo, previo a iniciar gestiones legales como el acuerdo de lesividad. El contrato entre el Estado de Guatemala y Ferrovías de Guatemala contemplaba 50 años de operación. Sin embargo, el arbitraje se llevó a cabo por la falta del Estado de Guatemala o en todo caso del gobierno en el desalojar a las familias que se encuentran instaladas en la línea férrea. Con imágenes de Darío Chiquito para Noticiero Guatevisión, Ana Lucía Ramírez. Sir, this was the moment in time when you when there was a presentation of the amparo, uh, the challenge before the Constitutional Court, correct, in relation to the administrative court proceeding? And That's not the case. Before the administrative tribunal, no. This is a constitutional tribunal. It is different from the administrative process, uh, and I already st made my statement in connection therewith. There is a difference I would like to clarify. You asked me if I had called a press conference. That is not a press conference. That is the presentation of the constitutional action before the constitutional court. It is not in the uh, contentious proceeding, the CVD. That event? How the news reporters found out about that event? I do not know. So they, they just happened to be there when you showed up? Correcto. You're not yeah, I have no personal knowledge of that. I didn't talk to anybody. I never knew. I don't know. That is not within the field of my knowledge. We could put up um, exhibit R336, please. I believe we only have this in English. Are you able to read English? If not, we can go to a different document. No, no puedo. No, I cannot read English. Okay, we'll go to a different document then, sir. In, in the administrative court proceeding, you filed on behalf of Ferrovias an answer to the petition, correct? Could you please repeat the question? In the administrative court proceeding, you filed an answer to the Attorney General's petition on behalf of your client, Ferrovias, correct? Correct. That is correct. That's put up RL70, I'm sorry, R, R292. Apologize, R292. R-292, 
R-292 is the answer that you filed on behalf of Ferrovias in the administrative court proceeding initiated by the Attorney General of Guatemala, correct? Correct. Correct. And you answered the petition by declaring or answering it in the in the negative, correct? In other words, you denied the relief sought by the Attorney General in his petition, correct? That is not correct. I wasn't denying the relief requested. Under Guatemalan law, when, when a complaint is brought and notice is uh, given, the respondent can um, respond by the negative. What does it mean? It means that it's contradicting the statements made by claimant. In this case, when we replied in the negative, if the state is saying that the contract is placebo, when we answer in the negative, Ferrovias is saying the opposite, saying that the contract is not placebo. Um, in addition to making that argument or that um, allegation through this petition, you also um, stated that your client was not going to be proffering evidence in the proceeding, correct? Sí, es correcto. Yes, that is correct. ¿Por qué? Porque en un proceso de lesividad. Why? Well, because in a process of lesividad, the party declaring lesividad is the state of Guatemala via the president of the republic. So the burden of proof lies exclusively on the claimant. If the state is saying that the contract is lesivo, then the state needs to prove that lascividad exists. Under Guatemalan law, we call that burden of the proof. Um, and there's an article stating that the claimant or the parties have the obligation of showing the statements of fact. If you affirm something, you need to prove it. So the state is saying that this contract was lascivo, so the state needs to prove that. Uh, Ferrovias does not have to prove that the contract is not lesiva. That is why uh, this was written in this way. Decision not to present evidence because it is your contention that the Attorney General has the burden of proof in the case, correct? Correct. That is correct. Put up R331. And it is, um, let's see, page well, they're not going to have the page number, so we'll put up on the screen. It's page 86 of the document, but you're not going to be able to find it in your core bundle because the pages are not numbered themselves. And in the Spanish version, it is 314. This is, well, you're looking at the Spanish version of it, um, and this is an English translation that's up on the screen, but uh, in this, uh, first of all, this is an, an order by the administrative court, correct? A resolution by the administrative court? That is correct. It is a memorial that uh, was uh, issued at the administrative tribunal. I just want to make sure that he has available to him the entire document so he can, you know, make sure he understands the entire context of what's being presented here. We only have partial translations of the documents. So, so he has the entire Spanish version before him, Kevin. Okay, thank you. I did not know that. Solo, perdón, el documento que yo... Excuse me, the document that I have is not the document that appears on the screen.
El documento que está en pantalla es el mismo. Translation that is up on the screen is the same document that you're looking at now, sir. Correct. Yes, that is correct. And again, um, this document is a resolution by the administrative court. Yes, correct. The administrative court is ruling on procedural objections that were filed by Ferrovias in the matter. Correct. Part of the relief that you sought through the filing of the uh, objections, the procedural objections, was suspension of the proceeding? I would like to clarify, well, that is not correct. The suspension of the process is not the same as the suspension of a hearing, of an evidentiary hearing. This was during the 30-day evidentiary period. Just to give you an example, today this is a witness testimony hearing, for example, my own. If my statement were to be suspended, that does not mean that uh, other witnesses uh, cannot present their statement uh, if the tribunal wanted so. This was the suspension of one hearing, not the process. The process did not stop, or was not stopped. This was the suspension of one hearing only. Sí, correct. Yes, it did. Correct. Well, that's fortuitous because I have no more questions. That's excellent. So, so I, I will ask very well timed. Uh, James, let me ask him first this time. Can I ask how common is the lucividad procedure? in administrative matters in Guatemala. In actuality, it is not very common. I have been able to conduct some investigations and look at information, and we have about 15 or 16 lesividad processes, so it's not very common. The common thing is that um, no um, ruling is ever made, no final judgment is ever obtained. Only in a couple, maybe, a ruling, a final ruling was obtained. Say 15 or 16, do you mean in your experience or in Guatemalan experience? In the experience of the country of Guatemala in general, uh, so approximately that's the number. You say that there were only final judgments in a few of those cases. How long did those final judgments take to be given? In one of the ones that I have knowledge of and that I remember, and I should say in passing that uh, this was a case that involved two agencies of the state. So from the uh, bringing of the claim until the um, judgment was uh, handed down, 13 months elapsed, approximately, I remember, from the, the time the first uh, claim was uh, brought until the um, ruling was uh, handed down. Taking the 15 or 16 cases that are part of Guatemalan legal experience, did any of those other cases involve contracts? Yes, yes, they were related to contracts that uh, were entered into. Yes, that is correct. And this is one of the issues that we discussed. There's very little regulation in Guatemala 
in connection with this legal concept. It is a bit ambiguous or um, obscure, this uh, concept of uh, la cividad. And I'd, I've discussed this with my students in class and during um, our research. There is no legislative technique. When legislators um, created this notion of la cividad, well, they did not provide standards. They did not provide the requirements for submitting la cividad. Why should la cividad be um, brought? What are the steps necessary for the president to issue la cividad? This is unregulated. There's only one article that deals with uh, la cividad. It's only eight sentences long. And um, the article clearly states that the president may declare la cividad of acts or resolutions. At no time does it mention contracts. However, this kind of decisions have been left in the hands of the president. And I think, personally, that this violates the rights of the parties to a contract, because there is no legal certainty for the investor for the investors' rights to be respected. If there is a change in the administration, the president, because of uh, a decision that is made or because uh, his advisors tells him so, um, declares lasciviedad, and then the um, investor is left defenseless. Has your uh, academic work in relation to the lasciviedad procedure extended to any comparative work with other Central American jurisdictions? No. I don't think any comparison could be drawn. Uh, no comparative law can be um, established here because uh, there are no standards, there are no requirements uh, to bring forth lesividad. You know, there's no equivalent to the Guatemalan La Cividad procedure in other Central American jurisdictions. Correcto, por lo menos. That is correct. Uh, at least, uh, as far as I've been able to see, that is the case. I also wanted to add that the court has handed down um, rulings to try and cure the deficiency. And the Constitutional Court has said that uh, even though the President of the Republic, via a, an executive resolution in Cabinet, uh, can declare la cividad, la cividad can only be declared related to acts that were done by the executive branch. Because perhaps we can find a President that declares uh, la civo, uh, acts issued out of the legis legislative branch, such as a law. Um, or the president uh, may um, declare lascivo a um, judgment. So from the viewpoint of legal uh, technique, uh, that is not possible. So the constitutional court has stepped in and said, La cividad can only be declared in connection with a resolution or an act if and only if this is an act of the executive branch. This was not the case. This was a contract and this was an autonomous um, uh, agency such as FEGWA. I may just uh, follow up on, on uh, Professor Crawford's points. First, he asked you about whether you knew about other de Cividad processes in Central America. We've been told in some of the briefing materials that there is a similar procedure of de Cividad in other countries, Spain and others. Are you, are you aware of other countries and might you compare, if you are, their de Cividad process with the one in Guatemala? No, I do not have knowledge of that. Uh, you mentioned uh, the 15 or 16, and then you said there were only one or two in which there were 
I think was a final judgment. Can you tell us in your review, uh, were there any final judgments which overturned the Lascividad decision by the uh, President of Guatemala? The final judgments that they affirm, or were there any that overturned and overruled a Lascividad finding? Sí, correct. Yes. Coincidentally, the ruling that I was talking about, the judgment that I was talking about, denied lesividad. We have to take into account that this involved two state agencies, two government agencies, um, and uh, this uh, was uh, solved in during the time established by law, the timeline established by law, 13 months, and I mentioned this. In that case, was there any other case in which the Sividad was overturned? Uh, no, in just in that one case, as far as I can recall right now. El profesor Crawford también. Frame involved. Uh, just in per terms of your experience with uh, administrative law, I mean, we have our own courts that don't always act as promptly as we might wish. It, the time involved here, four or five years, is this a typical um, time delay from the time of, uh, of a filing? Is it longer than normal? What, what is your experience in, as a professor in terms of examining this for your students in your course? Correcto. That is correct. It is not normal. It is important to uh, state that in the court where uh, the proceedings were brought, well, if you go to this uh, court and uh, uh, you ask for uh, this process, 389-2006. Uh, 2006 is the year the um, claim was brought. So you have cases in 2006, right? And there's no judgment. Uh, the others have. Um, so it is not common to have this undue delay uh, such a long time. That's not that's not common. Active case, is it not? I mean, there have been proceedings filed. There was a request in 2010 for, I think, a statement uh, of the parties. So it hasn't been entirely dormant. Uh, has anything happened since that request in 2010 for a statement? What, is, what do you understand the status of this matter? With all due respect, I have to say that uh, the inactivity by the court has been evident. You make reference to 2010, but just to give you an example, there was an evidentiary hearing in 2010 and also other hearings uh, in May 2010, but the uh, case was brought in 06. So to get to uh, those proceedings in 2010, a long time elapsed. The last submission was May 2010, which uh, was uh, just a hearing. No decision has been made uh, t to date. Guatemalan law clearly established that uh, courts cannot deny the administration of justice. So the judge has 15 days to uh, hand down the judgment, and 13 months have uh, elapsed now. There's nothing impeding the tribunal to hand down a judgment. Um, I guess there, perhaps what I understand is that they're waiting for this case to be resolved. Uh, were you involved at all in the uh, issues surrounding uh, the alleged illegality of 143 and 158, that is the absence of a public bid and the absence of executive approval, are those issues that you were involved in in any way? No. No, 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 no wise was I involved in that, not at that time. 
I was not a member of the law firm. Uh, I did not participate, no. And no judgment or opinion as a, as a professor as to why those deficiencies could, weren't cured? Bueno. In that regard, what I could say, because of the analysis that I conducted, is that a public bidding took place, uh, the right of use uh, of um, right of way use was um, uh, granted under 402, but no reference was made to the use of railroad equipment. I understand that it is not necessary for a new call for bids to exist. I don't think it's necessary for the President of the Republic to sign this document. I said before, this is an independent agency. It has a different legal personality from the state. So this agency needs no authorization from the president. There are judgments uh, from the Constitutional Court in that regard. This is what we uh, put forth in the Constitutional case that we brought. In order to end this, that is why we went to that court before going to the administrative court because it's a much faster way to do things. We felt that the court should take these things into account. It is not that the court hasn't taken this into account. Uh, it is not that uh, it denied the umpire proceedings uh, just because. The court says said that uh, the administrative proceedings were necessary first. In the Government procurement law, which is the specific law that regulates all these contracts, there is no art article that says that the President of the Republic is the one that needs to sign an executive resolution or uh, authorize a contract by an independent agency. So the answer is no. Question just from, again, your, your background uh, in teaching administrative law. One of the issues here is whether or not the Lecibo Declaration was, in effect, a final declaration that affected rights, or whether or not it was simply a step in the process and that only when the court makes a ruling could there be a finality. Uh, from your experience in the administrative law with respect to uh, Lecibo Declarations, do you have any judgment on on that what if is there effective judicial review such that this is only a step in the process is there a finality to it or again what if you have any judgment is this something that you address in your administrative law cases uh, courts the case uh, courses excuse me correcto eh, right Now, in connection with the first question where this is a previous step, yes, it is a previous step because that is what the law provides. And the law then states that uh, the administrative proceedings should start. But I wanted to be clear about this. I want to be clear about this because this has been uh, the subject of discussion with my students. What does the law say? Article 19 of the administrative law establishes the different um, um, cases in which an administrative proceeding may be brought. The last paragraph of that article states clearly that uh, the proceedings will move forward if the acts or resolution were not remedied by administrative proceedings. So, in order to go to the administrative court, the person had to first look at the different remedies set forth by the law. And this is opposed to Article 9 of this law. And I think it would be a good idea uh, for us to see that law, for me to show you the law, so you see this contradiction very clearly. Article 9 says that when there are resolutions uh, handed down by the President and the Vice President of the Republic, no remedy can be brought. 
Article 19 says that in order to go to an administrative court, you should have exhausted all administrative proceedings. But Article 9 says that no remedies can be brought against decisions made by the President. And then Article 19.2 says that, well, if those remedies were not necessary, well, then why? Because an administrative agency is not going to bring bring a remedy against a resolution issued by the agency itself, right? So, so there are no legal standards uh, that says how things are done. First, we need to define what is lesividad. Second, we need to decide why lesividad takes place and what are the necessary requirements that need to be met for the president to declare lesividad and to clarify that um, if we have, for example, contracts by the executive uh, body, if it's a, uh, an independent agency, uh, perhaps the manager of that agency or in the uh, board of that agency or the overseer will uh, come into play. There, there are all these efficiencies. There is no legal standard to declare lesividad. It is a discretionary act that is left up to the president. The tribunal has no more questions. Uh, Mr. Stern, do you have any questions? Mr. Orta? Just a few, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Franco. Mr. Franco. Um, you were asked some questions by uh, Mr. Eisenstein, Eisenstein about um, filings that Eisenstadt, excuse me, I apologize, uh, by Mr. Eisenstadt about the um, filings that have been made in 2010. He asked you whether there were any file, any any activity after the uh, the hearings that took place in 2010. Do you recall that? Uh, sí, correcto. Yes, that's right. After the hearing held in May of 2002, there were two requests from the Office of the Attorney General to issue judgment. I should clarify that that is not even necessary. The law says that once the hearing has been held, the court will have 15 days to hand down a judgment. And those petitions uh, to which he makes reference are uh, two petitions, if I'm not mistaken, that were presented by the Office of the Attorney General asking that the judgment be issued. Thank you. In relation to that point, as you just testified to, the Attorney General has twice filed motions before the Administrative Court asking the Administrative Court to issue a final ruling, correct? Correct. Correct. One of those uh, requests was made in June of 2011, correct? Correct. Correct. Uh, more or less. Well, I understand more or less that that's right, but uh, from memory, I can't tell you the date, but approximately, yes. September of 2011? CN. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Rovias has not filed any requests with the court asking it to issue a final judgment, has it? Sí. Yes, orally, yes. Particularly, I have done so before the court because, as I repeat, it is not necessary, based on the principle of the notion that the judge knows the law, the judge knows that once the hearing is completed, he has to proceed to hand down a judgment. There doesn't need to be any written petition for the judgment to be handed down when that is the act that brings an end to the proceeding. Submitted a written request, have you? A written request to the court asking it to issue a final judgment? Written? No. But I have gone personally before the court to ask that 
they hand down the judgment. Indeed, the last time I went, which was in mid-October, they told me, and I thought that was quite unusual, I went there, I asked for the file, a file of three, 389 of 2006, and they say, no, sir, the official said. No, the judgment was already handed down in that proceeding. And I said, no, that's not possible. Well, at this tribunal, we don't have any proceeding of that date on which a judgment has not been handed down. No, which one is it? No, I said, no, this is a lesividad proceeding. And he says, oh, yes, yes, yes. The thing is, as regards that proceeding, on that proceeding, there's international arbitration. Yes, that's correct. But the international arbitration has absolutely nothing to do nor does it stand in the way at all of there being a ruling and a judgment in this proceeding. Yes, but that's the instruction we have. Until the arbitration is resolved, no judgment is going to be handed down. That is what they told me. Said this to you? El oficial. Uh, the official, the official in charge of the proceeding. Si no estoy mal. If I'm not mistaken, the name is William Rivera. He is the official in charge of the proceeding. That you're testifying about to today. ¿Qué instrucción? Which instruction? To the official or to me? The one that you just testified about. Ah, bueno, él dijo que esa... He said that that was the instruction that they had been given there at the court. No, eso sí, no. No, no I don't. to your um, testimony that in response to questions by Professor Crawford, um, if we could put up the chart, the exhibit, um, R331. No, 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 sorry. Is this chart? Right, so um, we are putting up on the screen, it's uh, a chart that's in paragraph 300 of the reply on the merit? Is this in the reply or the rejoinder? This is their reply. Their reply. Okay, sorry, this is in the reply. This is a submission filed by uh, Fethoyez in this case. I'm sorry, uh, paragraph 300. Excuse the document. Oh yes, I'm sorry, this is the reply memorial filed by the claimant in this case, and it's paragraph 300 of that document, page 153. Excuse me, is he showing the witness uh, the reply brief to ask some questions about? Is that what you're? Yeah. Uh, yes, that's precisely what I'm doing. All right, the reply brief is in English. He can't read this document. Um, I'm going to ask him questions about the chart, which has numbers in it. He should be able to read that, I would think. If he can't, then he can just tell me so. Um, do you have it up on the screen? Okay. Well, it's it's up on the screen, sir, so that you can see the uh, the chart. This is a chart that was prepared by um, counsel. Uh, and it was lit it was apparently taken from a an opinion that was uh, filed in this case by Dr. Mayora. Now, in this chart, if you can uh, just follow with me for a second, the uh, that the first case uh, it was filed. This is a, these are according to Dr. Mayora. These are cases. Lasivo cases that were filed um, and have been filed in the uh, Republic of Guatemala. Okay, number one is a case that, uh, according to Dr. Mayora, was filed on uh, in 1991. I'm going to object to these, this line of questioning. This is not a chart he prepared. It's in English. I think it's beyond the scope of the questions raised by the tribunal. I mean, where are we going, where are we going with this? 
Yeah, so just, just to answer the, the question the council just raised, um, this witness uh, told uh, Professor Crawford that it was quite odd that a proceeding would last four years, a proceeding of this type would last four years, and this chart prepared by their expert directly contradicts uh, that statement. So, so the questions were going to go to to that issue because since he's holding himself out as somebody who happens to know about lascivo proceedings, apparently he's not aware of how long they last in Guatemala. I, I will suggest, given that the witness doesn't understand really the language, uh, that you address that issue, and it's an issue that has come out as part of questions uh, raised by the tribunal, that you address uh, that issue in the final submission or the closing remarks uh, at the end of, of, of the hearing. Very good. We will do that. Um, in, in terms of uh, questions that were posed um, to uh, this witness on issues of um, lascivo law, you know, he's not been tendered as an expert um, on the lascivo process. Um, he did mention today, and we heard for the first time today, that um, he's uh, taught some courses on that. Um, we, you know, we're not uh, prepared to cross-examine him on the opinions he gave, um, and so we would just let the tribunal know that um, we don't accept his opinions and we don't think that they ought to be taken in consideration because we do have experts on those issues. Um, and by doing that, we'll save a ton of time in terms of questioning. Um, and I think with that, I have no further questions. Thank you. And thank you. Muchas gracias, uh, senor. Thank you very much, Mr. Franco. Uh, you may stand down. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, two o'clock of that clock, which is a, goes, runs late, but is the one that everybody sees. So thank you.